Good morning to all of you. I want to read again from the book of Daniel this morning. We read there last week in chapter 1. So I want to read from Daniel chapter 2. It's a long chapter, and I'm particularly interested in verses 1 through 30, but I'm not going to read them. It would be helpful if you have your Bible open at that passage and uh, follow with me as we make our way through. I right, let me say, by way of introduction, that the message of this chapter is essentially twofold. First of all, it tells us that human wisdom is limited. And when it comes to the really important matters of life, human wisdom is empty and futile. And on the other hand, divine wisdom is infinite. And in every area, it is perfect and sufficient. That, I think, is the message of this chapter. So let's look at verse 1. Now, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. He had dreams. And don't us down at verse 3. The king said to the, he calls for the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. The king said to them, I've had a dream, dream singular, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. So I take it that this was a recurring dream. This was a dream which he had night after night, and it really was disturbing. And it says there that he was so troubled that, so, so troubled that his sleep left him. And not surprisingly, he calls for the experts. There were these wise men in the, in the, uh, in the empire, in the Babylonian empire, and they were into all kinds of things like the, the occult and, uh, and astrology and divination and interpretation of dreams. I understand they even had manuals of instruction as to how to interpret dreams. And so they were the experts. And so it's not surprising that he would call for these men and that he would ask them to interpret this dream. It was generally believed, I think, in those days that dreams had some significance. There was a message there. And it's certainly true, isn't it, that uh, a number of times in Scripture, God chose to speak to individuals in a dream. And maybe the obvious example is Joseph, right? Uh, you remember he has that dream, 12 sheaves representing his 11 brothers and himself, and the 11 sheaves of representing his brothers, why they bow down to him. And then uh, 12 stars and the sun and the moon representing the family, father and mother and 12 sons. And uh, what do you know? They all bow down to, to Joseph's star. And uh, I don't doubt that he understood that this was something that uh, God was saying to him. It was a message about, his, about the future. In fact, I would, uh, I would feel, I'm pretty sure, that this was the message that sustained him during those years when he was a slave and he was a prisoner in the land of Egypt. It was this promise. There was this awareness on Joseph's part that God had something in mind. He had communicated that to him in this dream. His brothers, they felt there was some significance to it as well. They didn't like it when Joseph told them what he had, they, he had been dreaming, and uh, they envied him, and they hated him because of his words and, uh, and his dreams. But uh, obviously, they, they took it that, hey, there is some significance to this. And they didn't like the message that was there. And even his father, uh, and we're told that his father, he kept the matter in mind. Like, hey, maybe there is something to this. And so there's an obvious example. We have other examples, the butler and the baker, when Joseph was in the prison, Pharaoh, of course, and the dreams that he has. And uh, so at various times in the Old Testament, God communicated a message by way of dreams. We get it in the New Testament, too. In the very first chapter of, of the New Testament, um, the angel appears to Joseph and um, tells him, fear not, take Mary to be your wife and tells him about the son that is going to be born. He's to be called Jesus. Later, he tells him, take uh, the young child and his mother and go down to Egypt. Uh, and, uh, and yet again, uh, another angel appears to him, well, maybe the same angel, but he has another dream. And the angel appears to him and says, now take the young child and his mother and go back to, go back to the land of, of Israel. So in various places throughout Scripture, uh, there are dreams, and these dreams are God-given. And it begs the question, doesn't it? Does, does God speak? Does God still speak by, by way of dreams? 
And, uh, and of course, the answer to that is, well, he can. I mean, it'd be absurd. It's presumptuous to put limits on God, to put God in a box and say, well, there are certain things he cannot do. Of course he can do whatever he wants. He can communicate in a dream. That's something that is, uh, that is possible. In fact, these days, it's not unusual to hear about Muslims who have come to know the Lord, that they've had a dream. And that dream has, I think, been confirmation to them that the message they have heard or are about to hear is, in fact, the, the truth. It seems to me that the, the darkness in which they are held is so severe that God sees fit to, to penetrate the darkness in this way and to give them a dream which, uh, as I say, is confirmation that the message concerning the Lord Jesus is, in fact, the truth. And so, yes, God can still speak in dreams. Well, does he? Does he for me? Well, I don't think so. I think it's very, very, very unlikely. I don't know about you, but most of my dreams are just bizarre. You know, they're crazy. And I don't spend time when I wake up saying, well, I wonder what that was all about. <laughs> there isn't any point in it. It is possible. But in the very unlikely event that God chooses to speak to you in a dream, you wouldn't have any doubt about it. You wouldn't need to go for an interpretation. You would know, hey, this is, this is a message from God. So maybe very unlikely that God would speak in a dream. But he does here. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He sends for the wise men and he tells them in, uh, in verse 3, I've had a dream. My spirit is anxious to know the dream. And he asks them to interpret it. And in verse 4, the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic in Aramaic. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew, but there are, there are some verses in the book of Ezra, and interestingly, there is a, a whole section in the book of Daniel, beginning here in verse 4 of chapter 2, all the way through to the end of chapter 7, it's written in Aramaic, not Hebrew. Aramaic was the common language when it came to business and uh, the diplomatic circles. That was the language that was commonly used. And in fact, when the people of Israel returned from their captivity back to the land of Judah, Aramaic was the language which they spoke. Uh, the Lord Jesus would have spoken Aramaic. He also knew Hebrew. Certainly, you remember, he went into the synagogue and they gave him the scroll he, and he opened it in the prophecy of Isaiah and he read the Hebrew text. So he, he knew Hebrew, but in terms of everyday conversation, Aramaic was the language which was commonly used. And so they said to him in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream. We will give the interpretation. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a logical question, isn't it? So you've had a dream. Fine. Tell us what it is. And we'll come up with the, with the answer. And he responds in verse 5, my decision is firm. My decision is firm. Some of you may be using the authorized version. And uh, for many, many years, I used the authorized version until I was about 40, I think, before I changed to the, the, the New King James. And uh, this verse, this statement here in verse 5, the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, in the authorized version it says that the thing is gone from me. And I used to think that meant that he'd forgotten what the dream was. So he had this recurring dream, but he couldn't remember it. And he says, the thing is gone from me, so tell me my dream. Remind me, jog my memory. But in fact, that's not what he's saying at all. It's not that the dream has gone from him. It's rather that his request and his warning, they are going forth and they have gone forth. And my decision is firm. That's the way it reads in the New King James. In other words, I'm not going to change my mind. I have uh, I've requested you to tell me the dream and I'm warning you about the consequences. My decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made an ash heap. This is Babylon. <laughs> this is uh, the kind of thing that could happen in the Babylonian Empire. Well, the answered secondly in verse 7, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will give the interpretation. They repeat their request, and he answered in verse 8 and said, I know for certain that you would gain time because you see my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can give me 
its interpretation. I get the sense that he didn't really trust these fellows. He knew, he knew, he was sure. If he told them the dream, they would come up with something. Of course they would, and they were experts in this area. And he says in the middle of that verse, you've agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me. And, uh, and, so, and so that's no good. How would I know that uh, your interpretation was correct? Well, I, I, this is the way I'll know. You tell me what I dreamed. And if you can do that, then surely you can get the interpretation right. So please tell me the dream and the interpretation. And they respond a third time in verse 10. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, uh, there's not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Uh, it's, uh, it's impossible. And secondly, it's unprecedented. No king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such thing of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. And thirdly, well, it just can't be done. It's a difficult thing the king requests. There is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Human wisdom is limited. It's limited. With all of their wisdom, you know, with all of their expertise in the occult and astrology and what have you, they were incapable of responding to Nebuchadnezzar's request. And it illustrates for us, as I said earlier, that uh, human wisdom has limitations. And when it comes to the really important matters of life, it is empty and it's futile. Paul speaks to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and uh, he makes a statement there to this effect that uh, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. The world by wisdom knew not God. He's telling us in those verses that, uh, that it was God's, it's God's wisdom, in his wisdom, God made this decision. I leave men to themselves, to their own speculations and to, and to their own rationalism and, uh, and in order that it might be demonstrated that uh, there is no answer in those things. And so the result was this, that the world by wisdom knew not God. It's evident that human wisdom is empty. Human wisdom denies the existence of God. And uh, it insists that uh, in a philosophy of naturalism, there is nothing, nothing outside of the material universe. It, um, human wisdom rejects the revelation of God. It substitutes uh, our own subjective opinion as being the, uh, the measure of truth. Uh, a couple of years ago, a couple of years ago, I listened to a debate. I watched it on. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I watched it on the on the screen, and it was a debate that was held at uh, Wycliffe College in Toronto. And the the subject was: Is there meaning to life? And the participants were um, Jordan Peterson. He's become a well-known character, and uh, he was quite vocal in that discussion. Uh, the second participant was Rebecca Goldstein, who is a naturalist in a university, teaching in a university in the New York area, if I remember rightly. And the third participant was William Lane Craig, who was a Christian, a uh, Christian apologist. And in the course of the discussion, he presented what to me was a very convincing argument, very, very powerful argument with respect to a world without God. He said, first of all, a world without God is a world without purpose without purpose, no goal for the universe, no goal for mankind. All that awaits us is oblivion. It's a world without purpose. Secondly, he says, it's a world without moral value. There is no way, there is no basis on which we can make moral decisions. Last year, I read, uh, I read um, Dostoevsky's um, Ivan Karamazov, uh, uh, the, book, the Brothers Karamazov, I read it when I was in my teens, I think, but I read it again last year. Interesting book, fascinating book. And in it, the Ivan, Ivan uh, Karamazov, one of the brothers, he says this, if God is dead, then everything is permissible. If God is dead, everything is permissible. And he's right on. What he's saying is there's no God, then there is no basis. There is no basis for moral decisions. It's where we are in Canada today, frankly. We have thrown out, we have thrown out the foundation, really. When you look at our history, this is a country which, um, 
which was based or which was founded on Christian principles. It doesn't mean that people were necessarily Christian, but the influence of, uh, of the scriptures was such that, that that was something which dominated and something which was important. In fact, I saw a clip of the prayer breakfast in Ottawa uh, earlier this year. And there was a video there which took us around the parliament buildings and identified the various places where there were biblical texts. That was the foundation. That was the foundation. It's been thrown out. And because it's been thrown out, there is no basis on which to decide on moral issues. The only basis is my personal opinion, and whoever has the loudest voice, he wins. That's where we're at in our society. And so uh, William Lane Craig says, a world without God is a world without moral value. And then thirdly, he says, it's a world without significance. I don't matter. I came from nowhere. I'm going nowhere. I don't know who I am. I don't know why I'm here. The whole thing is pointless. Human wisdom, human wisdom leaves us floundering in the darkness with no hope and no moral compass and no purpose. The world by wisdom knew not God. And so that's what is illustrated here. These men, with all of their expertise, well, they can't come up with the answer, but it sets the stage for a revelation of God's wisdom. And so we read that uh, in, verse, uh, in verse 12, the king was angry, furious. He gave command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the decree went out, and they began killing the wise men, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Interestingly, Daniel wasn't included among the wise men who were invited back in verse 2 to hear what the king had to say, uh, notwithstanding the fact that uh, he was somebody who had already demonstrated back in chapter 1, verse 20, the king found that uh, he, they were ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in his realm in all matters of wisdom and understanding. Uh, but uh, they're not invited. They were not party to this discussion. Nevertheless, when it comes to killing the wise men, well, they are included. And so Arioch is appointed to, uh, to go out and kill the wise men, and he, and he arrives at Daniel's door to arrest him and to take him for execution. How do you respond to that? I mean, uh, there has been no charge laid, and there has been no trial. Uh, there is no court of appeal. This is Babylon. <laughs> so what do you do? He might have got angry. He might have complained. He might have protested. He might have denounced the king. He might have uh, tried to escape. Uh, he might have complained about the injustice of the whole thing, but none of those things would have done any good. So what does he do? Well, Daniel does three things. First of all, what he does is he asks Arioch for an explanation. Verse 14. Then counsel, with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon, with counsel and wisdom. I, I don't know if it's true of you, but it's certainly true of me that I find myself occasionally, sometimes, maybe, maybe often, if I'm honest, in situations which are frustrating and difficult, and my response is not always positive not always positive. Sometimes there's a, there's a tendency to react, and, uh, and the reaction is such that, uh, that uh, well, it doesn't help the situation at all. It rather leads to confrontation. And what, would, what do we have here? He responded with counsel and wisdom, counsel and wisdom, wisely and prudently and graciously. There was no anger here. And there was no impatience. Uh, he asked Arioch, please explain, what is this all about? And uh, he has a hearing, and Arioch answers in verse 15, or D Daniel asks, why is the decree from the king so urgent? And Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. So first of all, he asks Arioch for an explanation, and he gets the explanation. Secondly, he asks the king for time to come up with the answer, verse 16. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. Now, I very much doubt, in fact, I'm certain that Daniel didn't just walk into the presence of the king. He didn't have that kind of access. I mean, even uh, at, at the same time in history, you remember Esther? 
when Mordecai says, you've got to go before the king and, uh, and plead on behalf of your people, she says, I can't do that. I'm his wife, but I still can't go in unless I'm invited. So there's no way Daniel could just have gone in there uh, on his own. I think rather that someone, Arioch, presumably on his behalf, either we went or, or somebody or reported it to somebody. But anyway, the message got to the king. There is this... Um, there is this uh, uh, refugee from, uh, or this prisoner uh, from, uh, from Judah, and he, he, has, he thinks he might have the answer, so can he have some time to come up with the answer? And the king agrees. The king agrees. And then thirdly, he asked Arioch for an explanation. He asked the king for time, and then he asked the Lord for help. In verse 10, verse 17. And Daniel went to his house, and he made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. He has a prayer meeting. This may, I, I don't know for sure, but this may be the first collective prayer meeting in scripture. But uh, he's doing what the Apostle Paul tells us to do. Doesn't he tell us in Philippians chapter 4 that uh, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, that your requests be made known unto God. Prayer and thanksgiving. So they pray. That's what they do. And the secret was revealed to Daniel. So he gives thanks. Verse 19, then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Now I want you to particularly notice verses 21 through 23 because this is the very heart of the chapter. And this is where Daniel gives us a description of his God. He's responding in thanksgiving to God. And it's a magnificent statement which tells us something about uh, his understanding of God. Notice, first of all, he refers to him as the God of heaven. Verse 18 says that uh, they might seek mercies from the God of heaven. In verse 19, so Daniel blessed the God, the God of heaven. That's a very unusual title that is uh, applied to God. It's only, found, it's only found, I think, 20 times in the Bible. And interestingly, six of those are in Daniel, and five of them are right here in Daniel chapter 2. Five of them are right here. The God of heaven. The God of heaven. And it's, not simply, it's not simply that heaven is his dwelling place, that he's the God in heaven. Uh, that's, that's, not really, that's not really the point. In fact, uh, doesn't David say in Psalm 139, if I make my way to heaven, you're there. If I go to hell, you're there. Where can I flee from your presence? There's no escape, there's nowhere to go. You're everywhere, the God of heaven. It means that he's the God over all, right? He's the God over all. Over all. He's the God who is everywhere. He's the God who's supreme, the God who's transcendent, the God who's almighty. He's the God, the God of heaven. Not only so, but he's the God of wisdom and might. Notice Daniel in verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. That's how he begins. And notice how he ends in verse 23. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers, that you have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's demand. He's the God of wisdom and might. In verses 21 and 22, he says a little bit more about this. I think we might say in verse 21, he talks about the God of might. He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He's the one who is in control, right? He's the God of heaven. He's the God who is all powerful. He is the God that no one and uh, nothing can resist, and uh, he raises up kings. He's going to say this to he's going to say this to Nebuchadnezzar later when Daniel interprets the dream. He will tell Nebuchadnezzar, "God raised you up, and God is the one who gave you this position as emperor, as king of Babylon." But then he will go on and say, "It's not forever. In fact, he says the time is coming when uh, another will come, a lesser." not as powerful as you, but another will come. And so 
he raises up kings and, uh, and he removes kings. He's the one who's in control, the God of might, and the God of wisdom. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things because he knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him, the God of heaven who rules over all, God of wisdom who knows everything and reveals what cannot possibly be known without his choosing to make it known, the God of might. God of might who does as he pleases. This is Daniel's God. It's a wonderful description of God, and it says something about this, this God and, uh, that Daniel knows. I have been challenged the last few years in various ways with respect to what is, uh, what is our responsibility or what is our calling as Christians, and, uh, and I have come to realize this, that first and foremost, beyond anything else, we are called upon to know God to know God. That's our, first, that's our first responsibility. That's our first challenge. My knowledge of God, more than anything else, my knowledge of God, not just about God, my knowledge of God, my experience of God, more than anything else, will determine how it is that I behave. It is the most powerful factor in determining our conduct. And there is nothing more important than knowing God. Jerry Packer, in his book, Knowing God, he says that uh, we need to realize, I can't, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, don't remember the exact words, but he says we need to realize that the most important thing that we are here for is to know God. Daniel, Daniel knew God. Many years ago, Dr. Lewis Johnson used to come to Toronto quite often and speak at the Easter Conference and I really enjoyed his ministry. And he tells a story about Robert Dick Wilson, who was a professor at Princeton University. Uh, after he retired, he would, uh, he would go to the chapel when there was one of his former students who had come back and was invited to preach there. He would go back and listen to him preach, but he would only go once. He would just go and listen to him once. And, uh, and afterwards, uh, on one occasion, he spoke to this young man who had, uh, had been preaching, and uh, Mr. Wilson said to him, I'm glad you're a big godder. Well, the young fellow was confused. Well, what do you mean by that? And so uh, he went on to explain. He says, well, some men have a little god, and they're always in trouble with him. He can't do any miracles, can't take care of the inspiration and transmission of the scriptures to us. He doesn't intervene on behalf of his people. They have a little god. And I call them little godders. Then there are those who have a great God. He speaks and it is done. He commands and it stands fast. He knows how to show himself strong on behalf of them that fear him. You have a great God and he will bless your ministry. Well, Daniel was a, a big godder, if I can put it that way. His God was a big God. Martin Luther said about Erasmus, you know, that your thoughts about God are too human. In other words, your God is too small, but God is, God is big. This is Daniel's God. And this is the God that he introduces to Nebuchadnezzar. <clears throat> he has the interpretation, he has the dream, and he has the interpretation. And so he comes before the king Verse 26, the king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I've seen and this interpretation? And Daniel, Daniel proceeds to do so. But before he tells him the dream and the interpretation, he has a message for him. And he wants to introduce him to the God of heaven, the God of wisdom, the God of might. And so he says to him in verse 27, yeah, you, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, they cannot declare to the king. They have no idea. In spite of all of their expertise, they are, they are helpless. But, he says in verse 28, but there is a God in heaven 
who reveals secrets. God of heaven, God of heaven. I don't know how Nebuchadnezzar would have understood that. <clears throat> I suspect that, uh, that Nebuchadnezzar had a, a, ne Nebuchadnezzar views of the deities was that, that uh, each particular ethnic group, they had their God. And so in Babylon, Marduk was God. And in, uh, in Moab, where Baal was God. And uh, among the Philistines, Dagon was God. And among the Israelites, Yahweh was God. That was his kind of perception. And uh, Daniel is introducing him here to, to Yahweh. He's the God in heaven, God in heaven. He's not restricted to one geographical area or to one ethnic group. He is God over all, the God in heaven. And moreover, he's the God of wisdom who reveals secrets. And he says he's made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. He will say it again in verse 29. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he says it again. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. He is the God who reveals secrets. And in fact, what he has done in this dream that he has given you he has revealed to you what's going to happen. He has given you, a, he's given you God's program for the ages. He's given you a summary of, uh, of human history, various empires which come and go and which will culminate eventually in the kingdom of God. That's the message. It's a message which has to do with the future. This is what God has made known to you, the God of wisdom, the God who is able to reveal things why he has made this known to you. And he's the God of might. He has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be, not what might be, not what could perhaps be, but will be. There's no question about this. There's no doubt about this. This is God's program for the ages. I'm gonna tell you about it. And you should understand that it's surely going to happen. God's the one who's in control. Look just for a moment at what he says in verse 37 when he interprets the dream. He says in verse 37 to Nebuchadnezzar, you, O king, are a king of kings. The God of heaven has given you a kingdom. He's the one who's done it. And, uh, and then he will tell them in verse 39, after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to you. God will in effect say to you at some point, or to your descendants, at some point, well, the Babylonian empire is finished. Then he will raise up another empire uh, for uh, for a certain period of time, and then God will say, time is up, and there'll be another empire. And then in verse 24, and the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. He's the God of might. He's the God of heaven, the God who rules over all. He's the God of wisdom who has revealed, he's the only one who can reveal secrets. And in this particular instance, he has revealed something about what is yet to come and he's the God of might, we can be sure that what he has said is going to come will in fact happen. That's the way he introduces his God to Nebuchadnezzar. Now with that in mind, I want you to turn with me for a few minutes to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Well, I've, already, I've already referred to this passage uh, and to one statement at any rate in this passage where Paul says, um, in verse 21, that the, the world by, through wisdom did not know God. Actually, look with me first at, at a verse in chapter 2, a few verses in chapter 2, verse 6. He says, we speak wisdom, not human wisdom. We speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God. There's the contrast. We speak the wisdom of God. What about it? We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. A mystery. The word mystery, the, the word mystery in New Testament times referred to something that was, uh, that was not something that was mysterious and difficult to unravel, uh, the way we might think of the word mystery, but a mystery was something that was, which was unknown, something that was hidden. And it could only be known if it was revealed. There was no way you could figure it out yourself. It wasn't something you could uh, apply your mind to and eventually come up with the answer. No, no, no. A, a mystery was something which could 
only be known if it was revealed. So he says, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The hidden wisdom of God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this world knew, for had they known they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Well, what is it about? What is this mystery about? Well, he says in verse 9, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Now that, by the way, is a verse which, uh, which frequently is, uh, is misunderstood. And that's a verse which uh, you, will, you will hear referred to with respect to the future, when we look at the future. And what lies ahead? I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. We don't know what the future holds. We don't know what heaven is like. We can, uh, we can speculate, but we really have no idea what is ahead. And, uh, and so that verse is understood in this way. It has to do with what lies ahead for the Christian. But that's not what he's saying. Notice what it says. I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him, but God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. And this is not something that's unknown. It's not something that's still in the future and unknown. No, this is something God has revealed. This is, this is the wisdom of God. This is the message of God. Uh, going back to chapter 1, he says in verse 21, in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. This, this is the mystery. This is the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is the message of, of salvation in the fullest sense. It's salvation which is to be found only in the Lord Jesus. I don't know how many of you come uh, in the same direction we did, but as we drove in this morning, and there was a church, was it the Apostolic Church uh, on the main street there? And, and I liked what they had on their, on, their, uh, on their board. It said that Jesus is not an option. Jesus is the answer. I like that. That's good. That's, that's, that's the mystery of God. The mystery of God, the human wisdom of God, it is, the wisdom of God, rather, it is bound up in the person of the Lord Jesus, and it has to do with salvation, full and free, which is to be found only in Christ. It's what we need. We need salvation. We need salvation in the first instance from our sins, don't we? We, have, uh, we are guilty. We are undone. We are undone. We are condemned. And more than anything else, we need to be forgiven. We need to have the guilt of sin wiped out. We need to have a new standing before God. There's no way we can do it on our own. And human wisdom will never get us there. It doesn't even begin to get us there. But God has made provision in the death of his son, the Lord Jesus, who has forgiven us. And there is meaning. It's not a case of living a, a life which is pointless. It's not a case of, well, we, we don't know where we're going. We do know where we're going. For the Christian, there is meaning and there is hope. There is hope because one day I'm going to see the Lord Jesus. And not only so, I'm going to be like the Lord Jesus. And there's no uncertainty about that. That's a hope that is sure and steadfast. And so this is all bound up in this salvation which uh, God has chosen to, to reveal through the Lord Jesus Christ. The Jews don't understand it. Notice what he says in verse 23. We preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, their Messiah come as a baby, and uh, be unknown basically, and um, eventually be crucified. This is, that doesn't make any sense. It is, uh, it is uh, just not possible. Just not possible. It's nonsense. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, it's foolishness. Why the very idea that God would become like one of his creatures? Well, that conflicted with all of their ideas about the deities. As far as they were concerned, the gods, the word they used about their gods was apatheia. The gods are indifferent. The gods are removed. The gods don't, don't care about men and women. That God become man, forget it. No way that could happen. And so we preach Christ crucified. 
And uh, he says, to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Human wisdom at the end of the day is empty and futile. But God's wisdom, God's wisdom is perfect. God's wisdom is sufficient. And in his wisdom, he has made available to us this wonderful salvation in the Lord Jesus. You've never trusted in the Lord Jesus. I appeal to you this morning. Recognize that uh, you, are, you are in a very serious predicament. You stand before God, sinful, condemned, and there is no hope outside of Christ. He's the only one. And for those of us who do know the Lord Jesus, why I suggest that we should respond to this message with respect to God's wisdom. We should respond to it with, with humility and recognize that it doesn't matter how smart we are, we don't have all the answers. We certainly don't. And uh, we should respond with humility, see ourselves as we are in our, uh, in our weakness, respond with faith and wonder and thanksgiving. Respond as Paul, the Apostle Paul does in Romans chapter 11 in these words. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him? For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Father, we want to thank you for who you are. We want to thank you for the little that we've come to know concerning yourself, but we want to thank you particularly that you have seen fit to make yourself known most clearly in the person of the Lord Jesus. He, you, he, he could say that he that has seen me has seen the Father. And we thank you that many of us, most of us, maybe all of us, we've come to know him whom to know is life, life eternal. And we thank you for him, Father. Thank you that you have seen fit to reach out to us in our lostness and in our weakness and make such wonderful provision for us. Pray, Father, this morning that if there are some here who do not know the Lord Jesus, that you would, uh, you would speak to them, you would challenge them, and that they might indeed uh, come to know him. And for those of us who do know him, Father, that uh, as we think about these things in your word, that we might rejoice in the great God who is ours and in the great sal salvation that he has provided in the Lord Jesus Christ. We give you our thanks this morning in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.